welcome to Plastic Talks. I'm Erica Serino, Communications Manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition, and today I'm speaking with Matt Simon. He's a science journalist for Wired Magazine and an author of several great books, the latest of which, A Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our Bodies, recently launched and was the focus of our October 2022 webinar. Welcome, Matt. And thank you for having me. Um, so I just want to give the audience a little context for our interview. Um, Matt, you were a recent guest on our October 27th, 2022 webinar, which was also the date of your new book launch, focusing on the health impacts and environmental impacts of microplastics. And we had so many questions during the webinar, and there was so much great information from you and also from both Dr. Stephen D. Allen and our moderator, Asher J., that we weren't able to answer all of them. So we thought it would be a good idea to have another conversation and answer as many of them as we can. I just wanna preface these questions by stating the obvious. Many of them do not have easy answers, but they're worth discussing and they're questions that are on people's minds. So even if there aren't easy answers for them, they're definitely valuable for us to discuss. So are you ready? Let's just dive into this. <laughs> I'm ready, let's um, do it. Okay, so there are so many plastic cleanup efforts happening now in the oceans and rivers and beyond. Um, where do we put all of that plastic that we collect out of the environment? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, this is uh, obviously most of you folks will know this. This is a huge issue in in plastics pollution, which is um, the life cycle of plastic. So the way that it has been up until this point, it currently is, is that we use single use plastic and we throw it in a recycling bin. And unfortunately, in the United States, uh, something like five percent of that is actually getting recycled and a lot of it is escaping out into the environment. So there are um, a lot of cleanup efforts that are gathering that stuff of, uh, and turning it into things like sunglasses, I think I saw one group doing. Um, so uh, the issue I think here uh, is that we need to think very deliberately about the end of life for that new product. So are you gonna use those sunglasses for years and years? Hopefully they need to be good quality products, right? Um, because there are, I think, a lot of legitimate uses for, for plastics, um, medical devices, and, and things like that. I'm, I'm very anti-single-use plastic, uh, but it does serve a purpose for other things. So uh, I think one of the particularly interesting things about um, gathering up microplastics, which you can't really do in the environment like you could on a beach cleanup walk for macroplastics like bottles and bags, but there is a company that is producing a microfiber filter for our washing machines where you gather up um, all the microfibers coming off of your synthetic clothing into this filter and then send that back to the company. And they're actually thinking of using it in home insulation. So this is thinking again, more deliberately about the end of life for these plastics where um, you know, with microplastics in particular, because they so readily take to the air and to the atmosphere, but be very careful about what we do with that stuff after we gather it up. Um, so there are a lot of different avenues, and and this is I think something that these all these these new organizations, these new companies need to think really hard about is that you know once you collect a, a microplastic, what do you then do with it that doesn't just guarantee that it takes to the environment through some other route. So lots of of options. Um, I would just say that it would be a very bad idea to to gather up plastic in the environment on beaches and turn it into single use plastic. But I don't think any any companies is actually thinking of that. So things like sunglasses, um, more permanent kinds of plastics, uh, certainly not single use. For sure. Thank you for those insights. Um, sure. To that end, you know there are microplastics all around us, um, as you've hinted at. You know, and obviously cleanups are trying to address that. But recently we came across an article in The Guardian that kind of hinted that microplastics may be contributing to the risk of dementia and Parkinson's disease. Um, and I know in my own research, I've seen and written about um, plastics uh, entering the brains of fish and maybe changing fish behavior. Um, are there any studies that you're aware of um, or studies in progress that document the um, mental or biological health effects of plastic on the brain? Yeah, that's actually very interesting that you mentioned that study on fishes. I think I think I probably cited also in, in my book that we do have very good evidence from not just fish models, but mammal models. So mice and rats in the lab that if you feed them or inject them 
with nanoplastics in particular, and, and may as well just define it here, microplastics are bits smaller than five millimeters. Nanoplastics are generally defined as, as bits that are smaller than a micrometer or a millionth of a, a meter. Once you get down to that nano size, and what we're seeing in these, these mammal models in the lab is that these things readily move through the body. They they pass through the gut and into other tissues. Wow. Yeah. They enter the bloodstream. Um, and once they're in the bloodstream, they're they're going to the brain. And if they are small enough to pass the blood brain barrier, then they are getting into those tissues where we do not want them. And there is, as you say, early thinking here about the chemicals that we are we know to be toxic in plastics um, that are are getting probably into our brains. It's actually very difficult to find plastics in the brain just because it's hard still to test for those those nano size things and, and actually separate that out from human tissues. Um, but I talked to a, a couple of scientists in the book that, that are um, saying it's almost a surety that we are going to find nanoplastics in the brain. And uh, we then have to figure out, all right, well, the question isn't, are the microplastics and nanoplastics in our body, but at what point does too much plastic become too much plastic? Right, um, you right. know, cause are there levels that are safe to have in the body? I mean, no, the, there's no such thing as good plastic to have in the body, but when does it become a problem? And yeah, a lot of these chemicals and plastics have been linked to any number of human health problems um, beyond the, the uh, neurological problems that you mentioned, um, hormone problems. So things like obesity, obesity there's, there's good early research on, you know, are plastics contributing to the obesity epidemic? And I, I would assume that the answer is going to be yes, just because these materials have known obesogens as, as they're known, these, these chemicals that mess with our hormone systems. Um, so, and then, you know, I, as we're going forward, it, it then becomes an issue of disentangling the contribution of microplastics and nanoplastics to these potential neurological problems from any number of other chemicals that we're exposed to in the environment, just because we have let the chemicals industry introduce all of these things without really any oversight, any good testing right. on what they're going to do to the human brain. Or, you know, when you think about microplastics and nanoplastics infiltrating every corner of the environment and every ecosystem, what they're doing to the brains of fishes or every other organism on this planet. But we know for, for a fact that these particles get into fish brains, they get into mammal brains, they're probably in our brains. When does it become too much plastic? Wow, yeah. I mean, our next question was actually going to be um, at what concentration or level are microplastics toxic to fish and to humans? Um, what is known so far about how much of this our bodies can handle? So I, I think what's interesting here about the dosing is that when scientists bring an organism into the lab, uh, usually that they're working on fishes with microplastics, they are typically dosing them with much higher concentrations than what you would find in the environment. And that's to elicit a response. That, that's to see if, if there is eventually a response at these very high concentrations. But there have been studies recently that are looking at environmentally relevant concentrations, which are concentrations that you would find out in the environment already as microplastics have flown uh, out there in, in just astonishing numbers. It, that's Those concentrations are going up exponentially as the production of plastic also increases exponentially. So in these current concentrations that we have in the organism, in the environment, we have demonstrated harm to certain sea creatures. So um, lobsters, they were exposed to, baby lobsters were exposed to these environmentally relevant concentrations and found adverse effects. Um, same with copepods, which are little crustaceans um, that are, are part of the planktonic community. Uh, so we have demonstrated harm at very high concentrations, which is probably reasonable, but now these new studies are showing wait a second, we have in current concentrations in the environment demonstrated harm to these organisms. I will also mention that in, in freshwater systems as well, there was a really good study that came out a couple of years ago where scientists at the University of Washington went sleuthing for a chemical that they thought to be killing 
salmon in rivers there after rains. And they, they actually track this down to tire particles. Tires are made out of synthetic rubber, which is a, a wow. plastic, it's a polymer. They found a specific chemical called 6PPD in tire particles that in current concentrations, currently right now are killing salmon in these rivers on mass. And now we have to think about, well, my God, that's one chemical in plastics that could be affecting any number of other fishes around the world that we don't know about. And there are at least 10,500 other chemicals used in plastics that might also, and a quarter of which are, are, are considered to be of concern among scientists for, for organisms. Um, that's going to be the interesting thing going forward is figuring out what is currently suffering in the environment from current concentrations of microplastics and what will be suffering in five or 10 years, again, as these concentrations uh, just keep skyrocketing. That is, I think, the real urgency here is that we have demonstrated harm and it's only going to get worse from here as these organisms really become overburdened by these particles that are piling up in the environment. Wow. Yeah, no, it's clear that um, there's plastic all around us and the threat is just going to only grow into the future unless we do something. How could we help people visualize the extent of this threat, um, especially given that the particles can be nearly invisible and that the impacts are so cumulative? I, I think the best number to put on that, and I think the most shocking number, is that when we're looking at just the atmosphere, so um, scientists recently have been finding more and more that the particles have absolutely saturated the atmosphere. And in the book, I, I talk about going and visiting one of these atmospheric scientists in, in Washington, and we hike up to the top of a mountain and, and find one of her devices that captures what's falling out of the atmosphere. And, and she's catching all kinds of microplastics in addition to natural bits of dust. But so she she took those calculations and some of these devices placed throughout the Western United States and calculated that in, in just Western protected areas, and these account for about 6% of the total land area in the United States, the equivalent of 300 million water bottles fall out of the sky as microplastics each year. So then scaling uh -huh. that up, again, only 6% of the total land area, that means billions of plastic bottles are falling on our heads each year invisibly because microplastics get down to the scale that we can't see them. Um, and then that is not considering nanoplastics. And there are only a couple of studies that have looked at this in the atmosphere so far, but one of them was in the very remote Alps. And at the top of a mountain, these researchers did the same kind of technique and, and gathered up nanoplastics instead of microplastics and found that if you were to stand on the top of this mountain in an hour, billions of these nanoplastics would fall on your shoulders. That is the scale of this problem. And that is to say nothing of how saturated the oceans have become. But I think the right. atmosphere really, really drives this point home that everything is connected. So scientists are also finding that the oceans, which have been receiving microplastics for decades now through through wastewater, um, are now actually burping a lot of those microplastics back onto sea. So they they come up to the surface of the ocean in bubbles, and when those bubbles burst, they fling microplastics and nanoplastics into the air that then blow back onto land. So this, uh, I think. Interesting cycle, interesting is not the right word, maybe horrifying is the right word, but uh, cycle <laughs> yeah. of microplastics in the environment is um, is truly astonishing that we have movement of these particles between these different domains, between the ocean, the land, and and the air. They're, they're moving quite readily. And in the atmosphere, they're blowing thousands of miles. And they're falling onto what we would used to think would be pristine environments. They're finding tire particles on Arctic sea ice, um, obviously very far away from any vehicle. How'd that get there? Wow. It is yeah. through atmospheric deposition. And that is, um, that's the truly scary thing here is that there is no place on the planet that is untouched. Maybe like, I don't know, it would have a harder time getting to the South Pole, um, even though the microplastics are lapping at the, at the shores of the uh, Antarctic, uh, because there's just in such stunning numbers in, in the ocean. Um, that, that is truly the scale of the problem. And then just, you know, other numbers thinking about throwing out, you know, 4 trillion cigarettes a year into the environment 
those break into tens of thousands of microfibers each. Um, just that contribution is stunning. Uh, millions of microfibers coming out of a wastewater treatment facility each year. Uh, what is not sent out from a, a wastewater treatment facility in the water that flows to the ocean is sequestered in something called sludge, which is human waste that's spread on fields as fertilizer. One calculation figured that Europe alone is spreading a billion pounds of microplastics onto their fields by way of sludge each year. Um, this this is the, the scale that we're dealing with, and this is the emergency, uh, in that if we don't turn down the tap, turn down the flow of this microplastic into the environment, these concentrations are going to grow exponentially. And again, Creatures that aren't suffering today at, at what are not low concentrations, but certainly lower concentrations than there will be in 10 years, could very well start to die. And that's that's when I, I quote a scientist in, in the story, when, or well, I quote a scientist in the book when we're talking about the ocean ecosystems, and he's saying that we're, in the coming decades, I think we're going to see quite widespread ecological problems just because you're knocking out these creatures in the plectonic community, uh, like copepods that are that are dining on these things. That's the base of the food web. Um, what then ripple effects go up that food web? And that's uh, that's I think the real urgency is that we we got to stop this before it truly gets even more out of hand. Completely. Um, and to that end, um, with the plastic all around us, I know, I'm aware that um, you know we ingest microplastic and you read a lot about uh, microplastics in drinking water, but is there any evidence, um, especially given the atmospheric concentration of microplastic, that we absorb plastic plastic and plastic chemicals through our skin? Very good question. And there is speculation that yes, um, this is, I mean, this this is the daunting thing, right? So we know that we're inhaling it. Uh, one scientist I talked to in the book reckons that we inhale 7,000 particles a day. Uh, we're eating and drinking, obviously, a lot of them. Uh, just by way of, of stool samples, we can reckon that uh, a human probably uh, uh, at least excretes a million particles a year. And that is not to say all the other ones that we're probably absorbing through our food right. and through our guts, just because they're so small. But these things on get on down on the nanoscale, and there is probably going to be the case that that some of them are absorbed directly through the skin. That that they're just down to that size where that is entirely possible. And then that makes me think of uh, microbeads. So when when the United right. States banned microbeads, they banned it in wash off products like like facial scrubs, uh, and it didn't touch other uses in cosmetics. So um, facial cosmetics, they go on smoothly a lot of times because they're loaded with microbeads. They act almost like ball bearings to kind of smooth over the skin. Are we then using that as, as a, another avenue for these microplastics and nanoplastics to get into our, our bodies? Um, but I, I think in the end, the biggest issue is going to be what we're inhaling just because you spend all day indoors which is a, right. a, a thoroughly contaminated environment again perhaps seven thousand fibers breathed in a day um that's going to be i think much more than what we're we're eating and drinking and absorbing through our skin so fascinating but also very scary <laughs> yeah um, i mean it's, it's not great news <laughs> yeah so um from what we know there are different types of microplastic particles in the sense that they come in different shapes and sizes to some extent. But um, based on your research, do microfibers and more fragmentary types of microplastic have similar or different effects on living organisms? Very good question. That, um, that gets particularly interesting with, I think, plankton. So when we're talking about copepods and, and other small crustaceans that make right. up this community of, of tiny critters that are, are eating uh, typically phytoplankton, which are these little algae that, that make up the base of the food web. Uh, these creatures are, are the perfect size to be ingesting microplum. So it, as microplastics were defined in, in 2004, the scientists were actually thinking, okay, well, we know that larger creatures like sea turtles are choking on macroplastic, these bottles and, and bags and that sort of thing. Um, but what about smaller creatures? What could they potentially be ingesting? And they, and they came down to 
to five millimeters as a definition, um, just based on you know what these what these little things could be eating and potentially choking on. And there is a good video that you can find um, that maybe you can link to it in, in the show notes of this uh, from a, a plankton researcher on Twitter who who just points a camera at these plankton and shows them ingesting microfibers and choking on them. These things are perfectly shaped to get stuck in a digestive system. And um, that's, I think, the the main concern among oceanographers uh, with, with ingestion is that these, these animals are filling up their stomachs with stuff that is obviously not digestible and decreasing their appetite for actual food. This is known as food dilution. Uh, it could also be the case that these plastics are leaching out their chemicals in their stomach um, right. while while they're choking on that could that could have adverse effects as well but it, very immediately if, if you cannot eat because your stomach is full of plastic you're going to die uh, and actually i'll just say that one of the earliest documentations of microplastics in the environment in the early 1970s was a researcher who was finding fish with with nurdles these little pellets that are melted down into bottles mm -hmm. and bags to make plastic products he was finding these small fish with these things that he say were like bowling balls in their stomachs. Um, obviously, they're not going to be eating uh, as much proper food and not growing as much. They, right. they just don't have the energy to commit to, to growing. So that's food dilution, I think, is, is the serious concern uh, among plankton. And that is not, you know, we then have to consider about all the other tiny critters on land. So what insects are eating these, these microplastics and nanoplastics that they're foraging in the environment. Um, there was, a, I think, a, a really interesting study that actually looked at the ways that animals, um, I, a lot of insects obviously turn into, from caterpillars into uh, adult butterflies or mosquito larvae into adult mosquito. And uh, these were actually shown, the, the, if you feed them microplastics, they actually go along for the ride as these animals transform into adults as wow. their bodies rearranged. Um, so they carry the microplastics along with them. These are the, like, when you consider that this material has saturated every corner of the environment, we then have to consider every single ecological consideration uh, totally. about the potential effects. Like then the science is just getting going, but we know for a fact that a lot of creatures are, and Jesse and these things, and and uh, I won't keep rambling, but I, I would just like add one more that I think is actually important is things like earthworms have been documented to eat microplastics that again we are spreading in large numbers on our soils because there is so much of the stuff in sludge, and that decreases their growth rate and leads to mortality. These are organisms that we rely on to keep our soils healthy. So all of these crazy ecological implications, um, there's a you know a good reason that I call it a poison like no other. I can see why you do that now, for sure. Um, <laughs> and so from going from that larger like ecosystem wide scale to more of um, what people might be able to do in their day to day, I remember from the webinar that um, the Allens gave a recommendation not to freeze food in plastic containers. So looking at our own diets and minimizing microplastics, does freezing actually result in microplastic kind of breaking off and contaminating food? Or is it more putting hot food in the plastic container? Or is it both of these things? Should we just not use plastic containers? I think that's something that a lot of people would love to know. It is both of these things, unfortunately. So when we consider polymers, the the three main things that are breaking them down are, are temperature, pressure, and UV light. So if you consider a, a plastic bag that's floating on the ocean, it's being bombarded with UV radiation that breaks it apart into these smaller pieces. Um, obviously, heat does the same thing, but also freezing. So like if that bag wanders into the Arctic, it's going to freeze and thaw, and that's going to break it apart um, over time. So the same thing is, is happening in our freezers with frozen food. Uh, this plastic is a very tough material, but it's not uh, an indestructible material. It will break into smaller bits, um, especially when you are heating things in plastic. And that is never, ever recommended. Um, 
I think the Allens on on the webinar, if I remember, uh, I think Steve said something along the lines of, you know, if you have a paper cup and it's able to hold hot water, it is lined with plastic. There's no there's right. no way that a, a purely paper cup is going to be able to withstand hot coffee. So if that's lined with plastic, you are pouring hot liquid in there, Yikes. and that is just demolishing. <laughs> yeah. It's demolishing the the plastic. And there have been studies that have quantified this that if you prepare hot liquid in a coffee cup it's it's millions of these these particles coming coming off into a, a cup of coffee the scarier i think study was done on plastic bottles for infants that, that these researchers prepared uh infant formula with, with warm water in these plastics and again the perfect environment for that plastic to break down and and quantified the babies could be drinking millions of these particles a day uh, in their wow. their formula. And we have almost zero idea what that means for infant health. Uh, again, when we're considering any plastic in the body, none of it is good. It's just a matter of, of how much is going to be too much. So right. do not prepare hot foods in plastics. Do not freeze plastics if you can avoid it. Um, it, it it's... Uh, really, it comes down to just doing everything that we can to remove plastics from as many aspects of our lives as possible. And then you won't have to worry so much about heating and, and, and freezing these things. But given that we don't have a choice as consumers, like if, if a lot of people are living in food deserts in particular, they might only have access to packaged food and, and not fresh food. They're exposed to more plastics that way. So this is in the end, it's going to be a, just a fundamental renegotiation of our relationship with plastic. That's going to require huge pushback against these companies that have flooded the market with plastics. And none of us asked for that, right? Like I, uh, none right. of us as consumers, like I would um, love for more of my food to be encased in this material. Thank you very much. No, um, it, it's going to require a massive change on the part of the industry. And it's going to require massive activism on that part. Yeah, thank you so much for that encouragement, because how do we change the system? We have to, you know, confront the creators of this product. Um, people were trying to understand, asking the question, you know, how do we um, get companies to stop recommending, you know, that they actually put these foods in? But I think your point of just eliminating the products and the, you know, putting, making food containers plastic is the, the, the way to go. Um, so I'll move on to the last question here. Thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge with us. I know sure, that sure. Uh, really excited to know more. Um, but a lot of the questions we received focused on how we might actually best minimize the creation of microplastics. Um, and so the Allens had this great quote during the webinar that all macroplastics or large plastic items shed smaller plastic particles. Um, so everything that seems intact that's plastic today are eventually going to be microplastics. So a lot of people want to know what policies to actually support um, that could address microplastics and which also work to reduce plastic generally. Um, so how can they also advocate in the face of a massive petrochemical build out um, in these conditions, if you have any advice or suggestions? Yeah, I, I think uh, I come back to, to microfibers in clothing as this huge source of microplastics in the home. So one study quantified it and found that we might, as an individual, produce a billion fibers a year from our clothing um, just by walking around and, and abrading that that, wow. that material. So what the industry is starting, the, the fashion industry is starting to look at is ways to produce fabrics that don't shed as much. There, there are methods of, of doing so. That's both as we wash that clothing in the washing machine, and it, it just kind of peels off these little fibers, but also just walking around. So in the end, we need clothes that are very, very tough, which is antithetical to the huge rise of the fast fashion industry. The fast fashion industry is not going to want to hear that their business model is fundamentally corrupt. It's fundamentally awful. It, it produces, first of all, way too much clothing that's then wasted. Um, it takes a lot of resources and energy to make that clothing. That is, again, I guess, I think actually with fast fashion, it's probably closer to 100% plastic now, whereas uh, just generally two thirds of clothing is is now made out of plastic. But fast fashion has certainly leaned into the, the synthetic fibers. Um, 
So we're going to need better clothing. And there is good research that in, in, in a number of studies that agree on this, that the more that we wash at least decently made clothing, um, the fewer fibers that come yeah. off over time. So at the beginning, you know, there might be a lot of fibers left over from the manufacturing process. There's kind of a burst of those, those fibers that come off in the first couple of washes, but then it, it tends to taper off. It never gets to zero, but it, it gets better. So that says to me that we should be doing our best to buy the highest quality clothes and wear them as long as possible. If we are instead right. buying cheap clothes that fall apart in the washing machine after six months, well, where do you think that that material has gone? It's flushed out to see it now as microplastics um, that are yeah. getting into any number of creatures. So uh, we need better quality clothing, which is not what the fashion industry is going to want to hear because the whole industry is built on planned obsolescence. They invented planned obsolescence back mid-century uh, that has now spread like a plague into any number of other industries. Uh, we have to buy new clothes every year because they're out of fashion, which is a, a truly absurd idea. Um, right. We yeah. need better clothing. We need research into ways that we can put together clothes that don't shed as many microfibers because people need to wear clothing, right? There's no stopping people from wearing clothes and, and from washing all that clothing. Uh, we need microfiber filters on our washing machines for sure. But at the very source, the farthest upstream we could go in that mitigation is just better clothing. Right. So go for the quality, not the quantity. <laughs> quality, not quantity. And it's just yeah. like, and that's just, it just keeps coming back to just use less plastic. At the end of the day, that's the right. only, that's the only yeah. thing that we can do that is, that is across the board impactful. There are lots of smaller things that we can do as individuals that for sure add up into something quite meaningful, but there is no replacement for just using less plastic. If you have less plastic around you in the home, as Steve says, that's less stuff that is breaking apart over time into right. microplastics that then get into our bodies. Uh, the, the, the challenge is that the plastics industry has very sneakily surrounded us with these kind of stealth forms of plastic, like our, our clothing, mm -hmm. wood floors now, laminate uh, vinyl that look like wood or not wood, they're plastic, right? So, um, that's that's the trick here is that we need to inform the public about what has happened um and then the consequences being we now have microplastics in our body and then the new research that will be coming out um in the next couple of years couple of decades is what are the consequences of that and, and i'm uh, very confident that they're going to be not great consequences yeah well thank you very much for keeping us informed and well educated on the subject um we really enjoyed your webinar as well as your book and I don't know if you have Great, any. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, any last comments for our listeners? I, I don't remember if this came up in the webinar very much, um, but I, I just want to point out how directly linked the the microplastic crisis and the climate crisis are. So plastics are our fossil fuels. Uh, and as the fossil fuel industry sees the writing on the wall that we're going to decarbonize and stop burning these fossil fuels, they want to switch to more plastics. That's, right. that's the urgency is that the exponential rise in the production of plastic is going to keep being exponential because this is a, a source of revenue for them. Um, planetary destruction is, is their business. Um, and we need, at the end of the day, to elect politicians that that see these crises as as one and the same. That we we can't fix fix the plastic pollution problem without fixing climate change, and and vice versa. These are intimately linked. We can't look at them in silos. Um, so it is a, about fighting the fossil fuel industry at large and the petrochemical companies that are that are making these plastics. Um, this is a unified fight that we as a, a species need to come together on um, to face down these sociopathic corporations um, that have destroyed this planet in the pursuit of profit. Yes, thank you so much for bringing it back to the climate crisis as well, because this is all interconnected and it's all about making those connections so we can overcome these crazy challenges um but thank you so much again matt and we appreciate sure. your time and hope to talk to you again soon yeah it was great talking thank you again bye
Thank you for listening to Plastic Talks. If you enjoyed this interview, please like and subscribe. This program was made possible by the generous donations from our supporters worldwide. If you would like to hear more interviews with experts and activists and would like to support our work, please visit plasticpollutioncoalition.org.